Hey YouTube, I'm DG Wiggins and I'm back here with another review, not review, of the latest book that I just read or listened to. And today I'm talking about Forging Hephaestus by Drew Hayes. The Amazon page here says, From Drew Hayes, author of Superpowers and Fred the Vampire Accountant, comes a series set in a new world of capes, cows, and superheroes. And the cat interrupts. As I did with my previous review, this is not necessarily a review of whether or not I think you should buy the book. I don't really care. Uh, I read books because I want to learn to be a better writer, and so I'm going to be focusing on uh, writing related things, plot, characters, um, maybe some prose, you know, just story structure sort of topics. Beware, this may contain spoilers. I, uh, because I want to talk about the writing, I kind of have to talk about what's going on. So. Um, if that's a thing for you, then go read the book and come back and we'll talk. But uh, I'm just going to talk freely. There may not be any spoilers. We'll see what happens. I'm just not going to censor myself. Well, first of all, I'll just say I actually liked the book. It was a long book. 700 pages of book, <laughs> which is about two and a half times the, the size of book that I normally read. But, um, but it, it, was, it was enjoyable. It was one that, I, that kept me uh, listening, in this case, through Audible. Um, from day to day. It did, however, have sort of a slow start for me. And I think, I've been thinking about kind of why, why it took me so long to kind of get into this. And I think it's the story world. Drew Hayes builds this world that's kind of very similar to our world is today, but there's a lot of differences, a lot of uh, you know, you got superheroes, you got super villains, you got people running around with, with powers, you've got cities. Um, no longer existing. Uh, they talk about um, the, the the original Denver, for instance. Well, you know, so apparently the, you know stuff has happened in this world, and so there's a lot of explaining up front, a lot of front loading with that, or at least I think there should be. However, what I found to be kind of irritating from all of this is um, the way that he introduces a character. He kind of name drops for lack of a better word, <laughs> and then later on in the book explains the backstory and the description of the character. And that works in the long run, but up front it was a little frustrating because he dropped the name of a character who sounded important, who sounded interesting, and then not say anything about them. And because, you know, later on he's going to maybe a quarter of the way through the, the book, he's going to have some uh, calmer moments where he gives a little bit of backstory of who is this person, what do they do, what are their powers. But by then, you've heard about them so much that you've kind of developed a mental image of what they look like. Even the main character was in this category where he, he gave a little bit of description up front, but it was more about her powers. And then I think it was halfway through the book, then they say, oh, by the way, she is Latino, uh, looks Mexican, um, you know, and they'd say some things about her hair and this and that. And by then... I wasn't too far off in my mental image of of what uh, the, the main character's name is, Tori Rivas, what she looked like, but uh, it was a little frustrating because I was still getting spoon-fed these details, you know, a quarter way, halfway through the book of a 700-page novel. That's a lot, you know. <laughs> That's like you know, learning about what your main character looks like halfway through a normal novel. So uh, that I found a little bit frustrating. I think that on the one hand, it's, it's, it's difficult to get this right, because on the one hand, you don't want to dump on the reader. You don't want to give like this police description of the character up front and say that, you know, they're five foot seven and blonde and, and slim and, and, you know, all this stuff up front when it's not totally relevant. And I also feel that you want to leave a little bit to the imagination of the reader. There are certain details that we don't need to know. In reality, we can't really remember all of the details up front. You as an author may be really interested in, in having your character look exactly like some actor or actress, and you try to describe them perfectly like that. But in the end, uh, that just kind of gets in the way. Give us the story, get on with things. So if it's not super important uh, that they have those, those characteristics, I think it's important to have some characteristics. So maybe the fact that the character had black hair um, isn't entirely important to the story, but maybe that's the, a defining characteristic. So, you know, later on you'll have redheads, you'll have blondes, you'll have other. You know, I'm working with the hair paradigm here, but uh, you, 
you need to give some characteristics, but you don't need to dump on them. On the same token, I think that waiting until later in the story uh, to give those characteristics is frustrating for the reader. So if it's going to be important, give it to me a little bit further, you know, closer to the front. Same thing with characters that are maybe just being name dropped. Um, with superheroes, maybe it's part of the mystery, part of the writing style, I guess, to say, uh, oh, Nexus, he's a big baddie, moving on, you know, just to give that sense of mystery. But that was also in, its, in itself a little bit frustrating because then I've got to keep track of that name for another 200 pages until he comes up again. So that, that might be just a nuance of the story that Drew Hayes has written here in that it's such a long book and that it's got so much diversity of characters, so much going on in the world, and he's got to explain all that. I don't know the, the right answer to this, but I do know that it was frustrating as a reader at the beginning of the book. Once we got into the book and I got to know these characters, he continues to build on them and actually develop really good story arcs, I feel, for each of these characters and really look at their motivations in most cases. There's one example I'm going to talk about in this video, uh, the character Nexus. We'll come back to him. Um, that he was kind of frustrating too. But one thing I did like about what Drew Hayes did in this book is that he, his character arcs for each character were really well defined, really well laid out. Each character, well, as you're reading about them, you understand what do they want and where are they in that journey? How are they feeling about things? It was very transparent in that sense. Uh, you know, for instance, Ivan, who's sort of the mentor in this book, uh, you know, at the beginning, he doesn't want an apprentice. He's sort of forced into it, and um, and, and and as he, he works with his apprentice, then over time, then he's like, well, this is kind of not bad. Um, you know, it's not as bad as I thought it would be. And then a little bit further in the book, then he's like, now, this is actually changing me. I'm getting more involved in the world, and I'm getting out a little bit more, and, and I'm actually really happy with the progress that my apprentice is making. And then towards the end, he's really happy that he took the opportunity to be a mentor to this apprentice. He's happy with her progress. He's happy with the, the results, and he actually learns to trust his apprentice with some of his deepest, darkest secrets. And that progression was really well defined, really well laid out. I would have really liked to see what kind of plotting or planning mechanisms Drew Hayes has. What, what's his style or what's his process for developing these character arcs or at least keeping track of them. Because, because reading this book, one, because it's so long, and two, because there's so much going on and everything sort of ties in really well, I have a hard time believing that this guy is a pantser. You know, or if he does, editing these things must be just a tremendous task. So that was huge. Another example of the character arcs that I really liked was um, the dragon girl, Beverly. She has the power to turn into different types of dragons. And she is sort of a side character. Um, she gets a lot more screen time later in the book. But um, you know, at the beginning, when she first gets her powers, it's a mystery to her. She doesn't know that she's got these powers and she almost kills her family and torches the house. <laughs> and, and she's afraid. She's afraid to, to work with other people, to be around other people. And that over time, over her interactions with other superpowers, uh, other, other characters with superpowers, she learns that there are people who are immune to her stuff, there are people who can recover, uh, she learns to, c to control her own powers a little bit better, and you see a very well streamlined growth in her confidence, in her self-confidence over time. And not only the confidence actually, but also her ability to reach out to friends. And so by the end of the book, then you see her working closely with her friends, with the main character, uh, with a few other characters, developing sort of a team. That, that tra transition from complete introvert, complete secluse from the world because she's afraid of hurting people to someone who's more comfortable and happy to be where they are and happy to be with the people that they are with is very uh, apparent in the book. And I felt that that was really well written. 
A mechanism that I think really helps with these character arcs and defining them and, and kind of watching them grow over time is the fact that the plot of this book, or a main keystone of this, of this plot, I think, is that they are in some sort of a training program. I think the training program over the years has become sort of a recipe for uh, a lot of books, particularly in the fantasy, sci-fi uh, genre. I mean, you've seen it in Ender's Game with Battle School. You've seen it in Harry Potter with Hogwarts. You know, a lot of big name books uh, key into this recipe of take the main character, send them to school or training or some sort of class, and then tweak things, either up, up the stakes. In this case, you know, if, if Tori, the main character, fails her training, then she dies. That, that's pretty high stakes, you know. Uh, and then on top of that, change the setting, change the, the course material. So, you know, make it magic or um, in Ender's Game, the, you know, the focus was on strategy and, and, and battle against aliens and such. Um, in this case, it's about, you know, controlling your, your powers, learning to stealth, learning um, to be able to deal with the real world and not be, not announce yourself as a superhero because they're in a guild of villains. Um, you know, all these things kind of play into this recipe of a training school, which lends itself well to character development over time. You can really set the things up into almost a program that you can come out and just explain to the reader. First, they're going to this class, then they're going to that class, then they're going to have a major test, and that's going to be hard. Maybe they'll fail, maybe they'll pass. They're going to have teachers that are going to help them along the way, and at the end, they get they graduate. You know, and and that's uh, that recipe is kind of already pre-established in our real life. For those of us that have gone to school, gone to college, gone taken a class, we understand that part. And so he's able to leverage that understanding of sort of a training program, and yet tweak things to make it much more interesting than you know high school was. So I think that that's a recipe that's really well implemented in this book. In my own writing, I, I've never tried that myself, and I think that uh, maybe not this NaNoWriMo because I've kind of got an idea in mind <laughs> for what I want to do that uh, do for that one, and I'll link to some videos of me planning for the, the upcoming NaNoWriMo, but uh, uh, maybe in, in a future novel attempt or a future story that I write, I, I think this is something that I would like to explore myself come up with some sort of training or school scenario where the character is going to be going to somewhere fantastical you know like Hogwarts or 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 in this case you know just a training to become a supervillain and use that as basically a recipe for a book because I think a lot of things are built in story-wise and character right in terms of story-wise and in terms of how the character develops which I think would really help and I really do enjoy reading books that send characters through some sort of training program. I really enjoy that. Right, so we've talked about the character descriptions, we've talked about character arcs, and we talked about the training program sort of recipe that uh, much of this book feels to hinge upon. The last thing I wanted to talk about is a particular character in this book. It's not the main character. He's not even, I feel, a prime character. I, you know, I know any of the main characters. Uh, his name is Nexus. And I don't know how I feel about this. On the one hand, I kind of like what this character does for the plot and for the storytelling itself. On the other hand, I found him kind of frustrating. Nexus is sort of this prophetic, force of nature side character who pops in out of nowhere for a scene or two. Nobody likes him and yet nobody can fight him nobody everyone kind of realizes that this character this nexus he's he's like gravity there's no fighting him there's nothing that they can do with it it's just like oh you again you know and what's more is that when they try to describe the actual characters in the book tori the main character says you know what's this guy's motivation and everybody says nobody knows he shows up he does stuff sometimes he destroys us all sometimes he's helpful but there's nothing we can do with him that is frustrating even to the reader which on the one hand you you kind of like right if a character is well written i think that the reader and the other characters in the book will have some sort of empathy in this case the, the other characters in the book 
are really frustrated with Nexus. They don't know what to do with him. He's just sort of a, they call him a force of nature. And you as the reader feel the same way. On the one hand, you feel like, well, that, I don't want to be frustrated like this. This is not an enjoyable frustration. But on the same token, if this guy gets used someday, it's going to be really good because I'm already going to be predisposed to not like him. <laughs> and so, so I don't know how I feel about that. He gets used in such a way that I feel is sometimes cheesy and sometimes really good. There's one scene in this book that I got done reading and I felt that was dumb. One scene. And it wasn't that the way that it was written was bad. It has a really good fight scene in it and it has repercussions throughout the rest of the story. But it felt like going into it that you have, you have some of the good guys and some of the bad guys. They're going into a club and you're thinking, oh, this is going to have some good drama or some good confrontation between these characters. And there is that to a sense. But what kicks it off into a fight scene is this guy Nexus who shows up and he says, I'm bored. I'm going to throw a monster into this. And it's sort of this deus ex machina moment where you're like, what the heck just happened here? You know, <laughs> this guy who's sort of a side, side, side character who doesn't really have a motivation decides to just juice things up a little bit. And that part, that just the, the idea that that's how things kicked off really bugged me. <laughs> they ended up having a good fight. They ended up, it was good, developmental for the characters. Um, the characters learned about themselves a lot, but it's like, why did we need to use Nexus to introduce this monster? Why couldn't he, you know, just sat back and been the observer? The observer part of Nexus is what I do kind of like, because while they've described him as this sort of force of nature guy where he's they're saying, we're not going to tell you what his motivations are. He's there to kind of, it's almost like breaking that fourth wall where he's showing up and not narrating, but he is sort of a, a, another observer along with the reader. And he's like, okay, this is going to be a good show, you know, right before a fight scene or he's, he's often used for foreshadowing. He shows up and asks the other characters, oh, is this the part where you two get in a fight? And the other characters are like, no. And then that, that, that was like a really creative way of foreshadowing that someday those two characters are gonna get in a fight. Um, that sort of mechanic, I actually really did kind of enjoy, but on the same token, I also felt like you could remove all that. It could have been cut and you could have had a decent story uh, still i think because it, you might have had to find different ways to foreshadow the really important stuff but a lot of that stuff wasn't th that was foreshadowed it wasn't it wasn't entirely necessary i feel I, it's hard to say this globally about the entire book it's a long book there's a lot of times when this happens but uh, i think that for the vast majority i could you i could have done without nexus now, this is book one of a series, what is it called? The, the Villain's Code, and the next book isn't out yet, unfortunately. I, I really hate doing this to myself. <laughs> I would rather wait until an entire series is out to start reading a book, because now I've got to wait for him to write the next book. But if Nexus comes back and plays a much more prominent role in book two, then a lot of my opinions on this guy are going to change. But as of the end of book one, I'm feeling like he was just sort of extra. Like he was there because the author liked writing him. And that, you know, and, and I'm not complaining about the length of the book. If it's engaging, yeah, give me more book. But I do feel like he was sort of pointless in some ways. So uh, I personally have tried writing a character like this. I think NaNoWriMo, actually the, the, just last year for NaNoWriMo, I had a character that was sort of remote and watching my main character and all her actions through kind of cameras and he, was, he didn't really interact with her all that much but he was kind of there to kind of, kind of just describe what was going on from a third person point of view even though the, my, my writing style was already in third person point of view, just to give it an extra point of view. And I really did enjoy that. But the, the hard part with that is tying that character into the story and making them relevant. 
and that's what I felt was missing here. So I think that if I were to return to that NaNoWriMo um, product, you know, I, I wrote 50,000 words that year. I've got plenty to work with there. But if I were to return to that and try and refine it and, and turn it into something more, I would have to pay particular attention to what's the point of this character? Do I really need him? Or can I cut him? Or can I find some way of giving him some motivation to actively participate in the story and and then to do so either in that book or in a sequel um, if this book were to you know I think that he went into this book I think it's obvious that, that Drew Hayes went into uh, forging Hephaestus with the idea that he's going to have a follow-up to this book because there's a lot of not that he just has a bunch of loose ends at the end but there's a lot of things that just weren't used and I think Nexus uh, is an example of one that what wasn't used enough to validate his existence in this story. So those are all some thoughts of mine. Um, I think that I'll, you know, the day that I find myself writing a Nexus-like character, I will definitely come back to this video and, and, and maybe even uh, pick up the book again and just browse through some of the scenes where Nexus appears and reevaluate some of these ideas. But uh, that was those are kind of the, the lessons learned I had from this book. I really did enjoy it. Uh, I'll put a link to something somewhere where you can get the book yourself because I do think it, it was a, a page turner, at least for me, once I got past those, those first introductory scenes introducing the characters. And, uh, and I did enjoy it. So I am looking forward to book two. Um, I hope that you enjoyed this video. I hope that you found it interesting. If you have read the book, or if you haven't, but you know, leave a comment. Let me know what you thought, uh, or even if just your thoughts on some of these literary topics that we've talked about, character development, etc. What makes it work? What makes it doesn't? Like and subscribe, share the video, and I will see you all next time with my next video.